All right, my friends. So welcome to another edition of Heritage Wealth Planning. We're going to have an episode on investing, investing for beginners. I, I got a bunch of questions uh, recently through email and YouTube and whatnot, and questions I've heard many times before. And um, and it, all questions are fine. In fact, I invite you to comment on my channel. The more comments, the more YouTube algorithm picks it up and and uh, the more helps me to spread the word for sure. But uh, I, I get a lot of questions on investing and, and it bothers me, not that people are asking questions, but it bothers me that I, I, I don't think we ever, ever have a discussion about how investing truly works, at least on schools, that's for sure. So I'm going to share with you some ideas and some tidbits that you might be able to use on your own investing. So that, that way you can avoid being taken to the you know cleaners. Uh, that you can avoid some of the trials and errors that many people have made and come before and so I'm going to share with this right now. And this is this is not on. I, look, I don't have a PhD in math. In fact, thank goodness I don't. I don't have a uh, CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. Thank goodness I don't. I don't look at individual stocks. Thank goodness I don't. I'm just going to share with you what you need to know to become a successful investor. And once you watch this video, uh, you will be more successful than I can almost assure you the vast majority of your peers. So we're going to start with this Vanguard. And I'll put links in the show notes. Uh, Vanguard does this chart uh, probably every year or so. And it's called, When Will We Get Back to Average Returns? When Will We Get Back to Average Returns? And the reason why I'm doing this live as opposed to uh, doing it via computer is because I want to show you some other things I'm going to share with you here today. And what we see here is the U.S. stock market, that's the S&P 500, between 1926 and 2017. So for investors and beginners, the, the modern era of the stock market is 1926. All right. Now, we have investments that go further back to 1871. A guy named Jeremy Siegel, who's at Wharton in the University of Pennsylvania, writes a lot. And I'll share with you a book that you should get. And at the end of this episode, I'm going to share with you uh, probably six or seven books you need to get to educate yourself. Uh, for sure. You got to start re thinking about this. And then once you realize how oh, it ain't that hard, you'll you'll be better to protect your money from scoundrels. I hate to say it, but there's lots of scoundrels out there. So we're going to start with the Vanguard piece. Uh, when will the markets get back? So the, uh, from 1926 to 2017, uh, the average stock market returned 10.27% per year. All right. You see that? So we'll see it right there. 10.27% per year, right there. All right. Now, returns fell within two percentage points of that annualized 10.2%. So it'd be 10.27 is the average, 12.27 on the high, 8.27 on the bottom. Returns fell between 8.27 and 12.27 only six out of 92 years. Six, you see this, look at it, up and down and up and down. And here is the average right there. Now here, that, see that little white line? And again, I'll put the thing in the show notes, the link. That is between roughly 8 and 12. So the average returns have only been within, I mean, you're talking you have an average of 10, 8 and 12%, only 6 out of the 92 years. That's it. And the reason I want to bring this up to your attention is there's a guy who posted something yesterday on the channel. He said, Josh, I, you know, the market at, or maybe it was a core. That's what it was. He posted on core. He said, you know, what does the index, what kind of rate can I get from the index fund uh, compounded? Can I compound it 5%? And the answer is no, you can't compound your interest. It's not 5%, 5%, 5% or 6%, 6%, 6%. It's this right here. So money going in, money coming out, money going in, money coming out. I mean, you just, you cannot assume that the previous 10.27 that we have since 1926 will continue on. We don't have, it's just, you can't because the markets don't give you five or six or seven or 10. They have averaged 10 going back historically, but they don't necessarily do it going forward. And I cannot stress this enough. You've got to understand how that works. If you're banking on the money to be there because the markets have averaged 10% year in, year out, I think you're making a horrific mistake. Now I'll share with you an experience from me. In 1990, I had no clue what investments were, none. And I was putting on a Friday night, late Friday, Thursday and Friday night, uh, this guy and I would go around to the in Fairfax, Virginia, in the rich neighborhoods, we'd put up these real estate signs, kind of uh, in clandestine, because I think it was illegal to do. <laughs> it's like in 94. Anyway, so uh, it was me and this guy, and his brother was our boss, and we'd go around, uh, just put up these real signs, trying to escape the cops, and the guy gave me like 20 bucks an hour, so it was good money. 
Um, anyway, so long story short, I said, Hey, we just got to talk about mutual funds. He goes, and I had, I said, I don't even know what it is. And I'll never get it explained. I remember where we sit right in front of his house in Annandale, Virginia. And he's like, well, this is what a mutual fund is. I was like, uh, I don't even know what that is. So long story short, I said, well, I might want to look into this. And so I bought a, I think it was a mutual fund magazine. I can almost remember what it was. I remember what it looked like and it had a uh, Montgomery Emerging Markets Fund and the American Century Gift Trust Fund were the two best performing funds that they had for the previous year. And they just tore it up. And I said, man, I want those funds. So I remember calling um, the American Century people and say, hey, I wanted to get, you know, put a thousand dollars in your American Century Gift Trust. And the lady, nice lady, she kind of laughed at me and said, yeah, it doesn't work like that. I forgot why. Maybe you had to have a hundred thousand. I don't remember what it was. But I was like, oh, I remember I was like nervous. I was like, oh, I just felt like a fool because she kind of chuckled. She was nice. She was sweet. But I remember thinking, I just saw the market had returned or this fund had returned that much money. I said, I better... <laughs> I better look at that. And she just kind of blew me off. So I called the Montgomery Emerging Markets Fund and I put a thousand bucks in there. And if you remember 1994, well, just look at the fund. Montgomery, I don't even know what's still around. Anyway, a couple of months later, maybe something like that, it's down to $684. I was like, whoa, what? And I only put a thousand dollars in there because I didn't know what I was doing. I said, what happened? And so I called and said, hey, why is my money losing money? I'll never forget this. And they again, I talked to somebody and she wasn't mean, but she just kind of laughed at me. And I was like, it was, that's, that's too strong. She was kind of, I could tell she didn't want to talk to a rookie. And so I had no clue. I said, well, I put a thousand bucks in there. This fund said it returned, you know, X, Y, Z last year. How come it was down? And she goes, that's the way the markets work. I said, what? What do you mean I can lose money? And that's the fundamental thing about investing. You got to understand the markets don't give you 10.27 a year. They give you this each and every year. And I cannot tell you how many people think they're going to get compounded interest with stocks. It doesn't work like that. If nothing else you can take away from this, remember market, stock market doesn't give you compounding interest. It gives a year over year and a rates of return, not even interest. And that year over year is based on economic growth and the dividends it pays. That's it. And I'm just telling on top of that, whether or not people want to pay up for the price of stock in terms of capital appreciation. I, I, I'm going to explain this again. We've had uh, 92 years of the modern stock market, U.S. stock market, is average 10.27. Only in six of those 92 years, six has a market given us between eight and 12. Every other year, 86 of those years, we've been above 12 or below eight. You simply cannot say we're getting a compounded rate of return when the market does this. You just, you can't. And if you do, you're doomed. Don't do that. And so you just got to remember the stock market can go up, it can go down. Over time, it historically has gone up more than down. And so as long as you stay True, unlike me with my Montgomery Emerging Markets phone who sold the first time it started losing money, as long as you stay true, you can make a heck of a lot of money. But you got to remember, it's not a, just a linear approach to the Northeast. It doesn't work like that. It works like this. And some years you're going to have significant re re results on the negative. All right, so let's flip this over. Now, that's stocks. This is bonds. So people say bonds are safe or bonds this, bonds that. So going back, and again, this is a Vanguard study, folks. Vanguard, I'll put the link to the show. It's probably the most important thing you should read as a new investor. The most important thing is for Vanguard, this study, when will we get back to average returns? I, I cannot stress this enough. I guarantee if you read this and you're not a professional, you'll know more than half the professionals out there. I guarantee it because I've been in this business a long time and a lot of professionals out there, they're just, they just sell what they're told to sell. I'm, and that, Look, I'm not trying to slight people. But what I found in my business, there's not that many students of the business. And what I mean by that is they don't take the time to study. They don't take the time to read. They don't take the time to understand. They just look at it like, oh, this is giving us 5%. Let's go ahead and buy it. And that, that's not the right answer. Even certified financial planners. Now, they're a little bit more adventurous, I guess, in terms of getting the designations, whatnot. But it's not that hard to do. You just study for an exam and you pass, you get a CFP. That's not, it's not rocket science here. I'm just telling you, if you learn to read the Vanguard stuff they send out every day, you will know more than I say easily 80% of the professionals out there. So even if you're just starting out and you don't know what the difference between a stock and bond is, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. I did not. And I'm a professional. I got 20 plus years experience with a master's degree and a CFP. And it took me time to learn. It took me some mistakes. I'm hoping right here this video will help you avoid some of the mistakes I made. So here's bonds on the back. Sorry, I got some blood on there because I scratched my finger there. 
Um, so here's bonds. And again, everyone thinks bonds are safe and secure. Well, since 1926, the returns to the bond market has averaged 5.35% a year. And returns fell within two percentage points of the annual uh, annualized returns only 20% of the time. So the bond markets have averaged five. And again, that's that you can't even see it, but there's a line that you can't even see. But see that white band is between two on the down and two on the up. So basically between three and seven, only 20% of the time has a bond market actually given us between a three and a 7% rate of return, even though the average return has been 5.35%. And that's the whole point about investing. The averages are elusive. You cannot bank on averages. Averages are meaningless. You can't. Now, over the course of time, the average may come to fruition. How many people were in the market during this time? I'm telling you right now, nobody was. So because of that, the averages are meaningless, They're completely, completely meaningless. And that's the stock market and that's the bond market. All right. So I'm gonna, that is number one, the lesson number one, read Vanguard. The, um, you know, when will we get back to normal returns? Because we never have had normal returns ever. And we never will. There's no such thing as a normal return when it comes to stocks. A little bit less so when it comes to bond, but not that much. All right. So now I'm going to share with you some books I want you to read. And the first one you got to read, and I got a whole list right here. I probably should have just taken it by my bookshelf behind me, but I don't have all my books up there. Is this guy, John Bogle's Common and It looks like he's a backwards. Uh, John Bogle's Common Sense on Mutual Funds. This had been redone a million times a Sunday. You got to read this book. He's a founder of Vanguard. Everybody hated Bogle in 1973 when he first came up with a, it was Wellington, a good fund company out of Boston. Uh, Bogle is a uh, part of Wellington. He's, he wanted to start this index fund based on his PhD thesis. I don't know his PhD or whatever it was. And it was like, ah, stupid. Bah, 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 bah. Well, he hanged in there. He took the arrows for all of us. And that guy's a man, man. He is the man. And that's the first book you've got to read. First book, Common Sense on Mutual Funds by John Jack Bogle from Vanguard. Vanguard ticks me off, actually. They let this guy go. And I'll never forget <laughs> I was working at Vanguard then, and he hit, I think it was 65 years old, and said he couldn't be at Vanguard anymore. I got an email from somebody, I won't say, from the Wall Street Journal. I emailed, I don't even know, I think I emailed something, not about Bogle. He said, hey, you got any insight on Bogle? I said, dude, I'm just a phone rep. I don't know anything about him. All I know is it ticks me off that they let this guy go, because that guy, in my opinion, should get the Nobel Prize, because he saved so many people so much money. All right, so you got to read Bogle first. Here's the old tried and true Burton McHugh. He's from Princeton. Random walk down Wall Street. And I'll put links in the show notes to all this. A random walk down Wall Street. It's just what this says is, I mean, it's a ton of stuff. I mean, I got just tons of notes in here. I, I mean, for me, I like to read. I like to keep notes. And that's why for my Kindle, I'll read my fiction on Kindle. But for my you know, nonfiction, has got to be in book copy so I can highlight it. So Mac Hill, uh, I think he's a PhD. I don't know. He's at Princeton. I know that. Um, the premise here was similar to the Wall Street Journal, where they used to have monkeys taking darts and flinging them at a stock chart. And they compare the monkeys' returns versus uh, the professionals. And the monkeys, more often than not, won. All right. And just uh, there you go. And that's what Matt Keel says is a random walk. We don't know what is going to win. We don't know what's going to lose. So because of that, you might as well just buy the market and hope that the market has one unit will outperform having individual stocks. You just don't know. Essentially, it's a lock. And I'm literally giving short shift to what he says. I mean, there's, I don't know, 500 pages of this sucker. Now, this was written, this one, I think, is in 1992. This is in 97. They've all had re revisits of those books, for sure. Mal Keel. So just um, Lou Ro Louis Roy, Co Roy Kaiser. I uh, used to be on PBS News Hour, not PBS News Hour, Wall Street Week on uh, on PBS. When I was growing up, my dad used to watch Lou Ro Roy Kaiser, Roy Kaiser, and he used to have similar things. He called them the elves, and I, I don't think it was the monkeys, but anyway, he called the elves investment managers to show us their prowess, and none of them really outperformed in terms of just a good old fashioned index fund. And that was back in the late eighties. Mal Keel wrote this book, I think, in the early nineties. Bogle nineties. This came out in ninety seven. So right now, everyone and their mom believes in index funds, but it wasn't like that. When these guys were writing this stuff, you know, people did not necessarily believe in the power of an index fund. What, and I just got to explain what an index fund is. So what an index fund is, is you're saying at the end of the day, you believe in guys like Mal Keel, Bogle, I'll show you some others, all the academics that you can't outperform the market. And you can't. 
I mean, because if you do, someone else is not. And I mean, that's a, it's a zero sum game. You outperform, someone else underperforms. There's just no other way around that. So you can't outperform the market. And once you kind of get that in your head, you say, I'm just going to buy the market. And the market is an index. You just say, I, I don't know what's going to happen at GE. I mean, how many professionals out there prognosticated back in December of 2016 that GE was going to lose 65% of its market value? And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, I don't follow it, so I don't know. Frankly, I don't care because I've been around long enough to realize I could literally care less what these guys think. I just don't think anyone did. Who knew that GE was going to fall on hard times? And I can't remember if it's delisted from the S&P 500 or the Dow or both. But either way, that's GE. Uh Okay, so some Bruce asked me a question. I'll get to it here in just a second, uh, Bruce. That was GE. Everyone's blue chip. Blue, GE. No one knew what was going to happen at GE. Um, and so because of that, these prognosticators who think they know all this, that, and the other, they just don't. So what you need to do is buy GE, buy Tesla, buy, uh, I mean, everything that's out there. But you don't do it by going and buying individual stocks. You do it by the index, the S&P 500 index, the uh, total stock market index. And that's what you want to buy. So you say or the TSP to give you an example, the C fund at the TSP, the S fund at the TSP, a thrift savings plan for government and military people. Those are index funds that don't say I'm going to beat the market. I'm just going to match the market. But because my fees are so low, I am going to outperform the vast majority of my peers. Because remember, trying to beat the market is a zero sum game and you can't. So if I can't beat it, I'm going to join it. And because my fees are so low, it's almost non-existent in the TSP. I, after fees, the average investor who's trying to beat the market is down here. I'm up here simply because I don't have to pay the fees. The academics are so overwhelming in this regard. It's not even debatable. All right. The other one is a bunch more, not a bunch, a couple. This is uh, Siegel, Jeremy Siegel, stocks for the run, long run. And this is, uh, he did an addition after the Great Recession. You got to get this one too. Jeremy Siegel, stocks for the long run. If you, uh, Siegel's from Wharton, University of Pennsylvania, Malkiel again from Princeton. And uh, Bogle just, he just, Bogle. I mean, he just, he is Bogle. So there's nothing, he doesn't need to be anywhere because wherever he is, that's Bogle. Uh, uh, again, Wharton and Siegel, he's, he's out there all the time. Uh, Siegel is one of the few that were talking positive about the markets under, um, when was he 2009 or 10? I think I can't remember what everyone's like, oh, no, me. It's like 2013. Siegel's progno prognostication was that the markets had plenty of time to grow simply because he looked at PE ratios relative to the 10 year treasury and Siegel has turned out right more often than wrong. And that stocks a long run. This is the Bible. If I had one book, it'd probably be Bogles, but this would become a second. I mean, this guy, you know, again, 400 pages, just wonderful stuff. All right. So a couple other ones. See, I do like the, uh, there is one active management company. It's called American Funds. This guy, Charles Ellis, had written about uh, American Funds. If you're familiar with American Funds, they're sold by brokers. Uh, Ed Jones guys and, uh, you know, Merrill Lynch, I guess. I don't know. But Ed Jones in particular, Edward Jones. And so a lot of people are down on American funds because they charge commissions. I, frankly, if you got to pay somebody to invest, pay an upfront commission and don't ever pay another fee. Uh, this a whole idea that I got to charge 1% to get better performance relative to paying American funds just 5.5% upfront. It's just as silly. That 1% is so much more expensive to you in the long run than paying a 5.5% upfront commission on 50,000 bucks. It's not even debatable. I don't, I just don't understand why everyone's hating on commission guys. I mean, as long as they're not churning you, if you bought the capital or a investment company of America in 1934, when this sucker came out, even I got, again, sorry about that. I got to cut my finger. Even if you got this guy back in 1934 and you paid a five and a half percent commission, you smoked almost everything else out there. Even if you pay the front end commission, as long as you stuck to it, as long as you didn't churn and burn. And that's the thing that makes you mad. People will say, oh, you don't need that American funds anymore. You should go over to Oppenheimer. Yeah, well, Oppenheimer now is going to charge you another 5.5%. And that's not the way to go. But if you pay a commission on the front end to a company like American funds, you can't beat that. You can't. If you're going to pay somebody, uh, preferably just do an index want to be done with it. But you know, American funds has got a track record, even though they're actively managed to, to, to write home about. And the reason is they keep their fees low. That's what it is. They have value-oriented investments. They keep their fees low. American Funds is a wonderful, wonderful company. The two mutual funds I'd choose would be American Funds and Vanguard. American Funds for active management, Vanguard for indexing. You, I just It's going to be tough to go wrong there for sure. 
here's my man. Now this uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, he, he is a, a mathematician. Just a one the misbehavior of markets. All these prognosticators out there. This this is, oh man, I love this guy. If you're at all familiar with Nas, uh, Nassim Taleb, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, um, he he's what introduced me to Benoit Mandelbrot. And ironically, my daughter was studying him when she's studying mathematics, and he does fractals and things like that, where you just you got to look beyond just the initial vision of what you see. Man, this guy. This, but this would be, you know, start with these other ones first. I'll put again all these in the show notes. Benoit uh, Mandelbrot, the misbehavior markets, and, and Taleb. I don't even have anything uh, by uh, Nassim. Uh, he did the long, the, uh, the the black swan. Man, that guy. Both these guys. If you want to say, oh, the markets do this, so they should do that. Just read Benoit and Bet or read Nassim Taleb, and you'll be like, Ooh, yeah, I wasn't preparing for counting on the long tail risk. All right, we got two more or three more, I guess. This is a good one, Probable Outcomes. And this guy's is um, Ed Esterling. And uh, this might be a little bit too in-depth for a new investor, but I think it's pretty interesting. A secular stock market insights. And I just, I just, I hammered this. I got uh, highlights all over the place, but he just shows the charts um, in terms of historical.